Hi folks, hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. Love to everybody out there. Uh, we're just going to reflect on three articles today by an atheist called whose blog is Use of Reason and it's by and the blog is run by a Dr. Alex Malpass and uh, his blog is Use of Reason. Uh, he's an atheist. He's been on the Magic Sandwich Show. He's been on J.D. Kane. And he's written a couple of articles, and he's got a PhD. I think it's something to do with logic or specialized in logic. And um, I just wanted to engage with some of his articles. And um, so uh, my website is jasonburnspreacher.com, jasonburnspreacher.com. And uh, I'll, I'll address uh, Alex or Dr. Malpass personally. So Dr. Malpass, I'll, I'll address these criticisms to you. So we'll go to the first article. And you can read these articles. They're very interesting. Uh, Dr. Malpass is a very intelligent man. Uh, he obviously knows his stuff when it comes to logic. And um, so you can't take away uh, his academic ability in that area. Um, However, one criticism that I do have of you, uh, Dr. Malpass, is uh, when you were on the Bible Company Wing show, um, you were mentioning uh, Clarkian logic and things. And there was somebody on that show, uh, the Bible Company Wing show, who said, have you read him? And at the time, you admitted you hadn't. And for someone who has a PhD in logic, uh, to admit something like that, I, I, I can't understand where you're coming from as an academic. You know, I mean, you've got to, you, you know your stuff in, in terms of logic, but when you're critiquing other people's views, you, you, you should really um, have looked at the material before you start um, pontificating as if you're some kind of expert in the topic. So that was a real uh, blow to you when you was asked that question. Anyhow, uh, on Dr. Malpass's um, blog, uh, Use of Reason, the article Creation X Nilo. Um, in this article, he takes the position that there's, it basically, to put it in a nutshell, there's, it's semantically incorrect to give nothingness uh, any ontological significance. That's basically what he's saying. That it's semantically incorrect to do that. And so what he does, he position himself, at, and you get it at the end, he says, Um, there is no reason provided in Bushy's post to think that the universe has to have a cause. One should resist the temptation to verify it. There is no reason provided by Bushy's post to think that the universe has to have a cause. One should resist the temptation to reify nothingness into an um, amorphous blob lacking any certain properties. Don't slide from a failure of reference to an existing thing to a sexual reference to a non existent thing. The universe didn't pop into existence from a pre existent state. Of nothingness so that that kind of verifies what I've said he's basically saying that there's no ontological grounding for nothingness it just has a finite past that's the key it, it, it basically dr. Alex Malpass basically the semantic game that you play comes down to that it just has a finite past We'll read on. But that, that sums the article up, really, as far as I'm concerned. At least maybe it does. Maybe it is. I don't know whether the universe was created or not. Maybe a loving personal God made it in order to teach me about morality. Maybe it popped into existence from a pre existent state of nothing. Maybe it just all there is. My point is that you don't get to prove the first of these by undermining the second, given there is a coherent third. That would be a fallacy of false dichotomy. So he's kind of very clever in playing semantics. He 
it's very clever and this is what a lot of the atheist debaters like Klaus are the, the, the debate is really quite simple the debate is how did all material things come into being when I mean material I'm using it in the philosophical sense of physical or physicalism so that's the basically that's the simple point and so what dr Malplas does is just play a semantic game and it's purely semantics it's purely semantics if the universe had a finite pass was that finite pass physical if it's physical how did it come from the non-physical? That's the question. And if you're intellectually honest, if you're really, really intellectually honest, it does point you to God. Now you can try and get all around uh, with playing semantics like uh, Krauss does, saying that, you know, mathematically, if we get the ratios of the universe, we can reduce it to nothing and all the rest of it. But nothing is nothing. Whether you give it an ontological grounding or a non-ontological grounding, it's nothing. And how did the material or the physical, which if you want to take the philosophical definition of physical, uh, of physicalism or whatever, how did it come from nothing? And if you're honestly, logically true, it could have only come from that which was immaterial. Which points you to God. So, what Dr. Alex Marplas does is he blinds you with science, he blinds you with this sophisticated game of semantics. And because you're not a professional philosopher, or you're not professional in, in logic, you, you see these logical equations, you see him dancing around with semantics and you think, whoa, we knows his stuff. Ooh, ooh. But ultimately when push comes to shove, he's just dancing around semantics. It doesn't actually get to the actual meat of the nitty gritty of the issue. It's not really intellectually honest. That's my first article that I read. That's what I, what came across to me. He doesn't actually address the issues. He doesn't go into Krauss. He doesn't go into. He just doesn't. He just doesn't really. One of the things is, is he's very good at strawmanning his opponents. You're very good, Doctor Malplas, at strawmanning your opponents. You. You don't actually go into the kind of scholarship of that particular topic. You, you know your own stuff, which is logic. But when you're veering into physics or you're veering into things like that, you don't actually represent your opponents in a proper way. You don't represent their scholarship. You don't engage with the scholarship. You didn't engage with uh, Krauss or you didn't uh, you didn't engage with uh, uh, opponents of Krauss and criticism of Krauss uh, on these topics. And what you did is you know your stuff about logic, and so you were able to play semantics the same goes for the next article the Matt Slick fallacy so I would call it the Dr. Alex Malplax folly Malpass fallacy and that is just because you're clever at blinding people with logic and semantics doesn't necessarily mean that your arguments have any valid validity it's called the Dr. Alex Malpass fallacy So, the next article I read is the Matt Slick fallacy, fallacy, quotes, fallacy. This is the, this is the article here. Yeah. There's the first article I downloaded. Here's the second article.
His writing style reminds me of the middle-aged monks who were debating whether I'm, how many angels could stand on a pin, pinhead. He kind of reminds me of the middle-aged monks like that who were debating these very intricate logical arguments and debates about minutiae words and you know don scottus and all and all the rest of it who were arguing about meaning of words kind of uh analytical philosophy of say a wittgenstein it kind of remind it kind of reminds me of those kind of thinkers who, who just get bogged down with with very intricate semantical games you could say it's precisional thinking but i i would just say it's philosophical waffle so in the max lit fallacy he doesn't really address the issue of logic there he's supposed to do but he doesn't actually address it i think um he makes a good point here verse 10 a very interesting uh, reflective point he makes one or two good points he goes the situation is a sort of similar to a well-known difficulty of the idea of god that god caused time to exist the creation of something is change change without time but the creation of time is a change specifically the change from time from time not existing to time existing this change presupposes that time exists and time before time started to exist and time after it started to exist so the creation of time can only take place if time already exists thus, thus there is an incoherent in the idea of the creation of time or notion of creation cannot be applied to the notion of time without becoming incoherent in other words creation presupposes time you cannot make sense of creation very interesting um, philosophical reflection Now consider the claim that God created logic. What was it like before God created logic? You couldn't use logical inference. There would be no logical truths. Now this debate here, when he gets to this, is irrelevant. Again, it's strong man in the Christian position. That the very nature of God, who God is, is the issue about logic. Is it the nature of God to be logical or not? That's the question, and that's the issue that he doesn't really look at. Um, then he gets into all this intricate um, notation, logical notation. He goes, since the, the significance of the regress is that on tribalism, you cannot talk about what, what it was like before logic was created because you would immediately have to contradict yourself, whatever you said. Here again, it's straw money. It's straw money presuppositionalism. You know, he's throwing presuppositionalism. Is presuppositionalism saying that logic was created? You know, surely he knows, he should know about the debates about uh, logic and the nature of God with uh, Van Til and gordon clark but obviously he doesn't know he, he might know now but he doesn't know about those debates here because he's obviously not aware of that debate if you go on to uh what's his name uh phil fernandez website you can read his phd on this debate of between clark and tell about logic but the point is is it's a straw man when someone is used to happen like then I caused my wine glass to break by knocking it on the floor. Proposition became true. The glass is broken, which was previously not true. So before God caused logic, predictions were true. It was true that he had not already caused logic. I mean, this is just not even dealing with uh, presuppositionalism. It's arguing about something that, that is not presuppositionalism. Uh, so... Um, so basically he just misrepresents misrepresenting presuppositionalism by not really under, not having actually 
in, you know, he might have done recently, but at the time of writing this article, he's obviously not read uh, presuppositionists. He goes, AJ Kitt tried to defend Matt Slick's argument against my critique, but his criticisms were hard to make sense of and unsubstantiated, like the charge that I substituted existence for cause. I can see no evidence for Slick using God. Now, I've not read your article on Matt Slick, but I have read this article, and this article does, at times, misrepresent your opponents. You do misrepresent the presuppositional position, so I can believe there's a possibility that AG Kit is, is right. The wonderful thing about this is you assume that uh, Mr. Kit is a Christian. But he wasn't. He's just the guy who's a psychologist who picked up on your article and gave it a critique. Which again shows your lack of ability to engage in proper scholarship. Not understanding your opponents properly is a, is a very... Um, dubious way of doing scholarship which is reprehensible if you're supposed to be an academic with a phd in logic so we go on to the next article the use of reason so i mean the that slick one basically again he, he he gets bogged down in semantics saying i didn't change a word i didn't do this i didn't do that and if you did this it means that and if it means that it does this and, and it's just a logical twaddle. It just doesn't actually deal with the issues at hand. So now we get to the creme de la creme. Now we get to the cake. Now we get to the meat. Now we get to all this debate and discussion is about the nature of logic. And does the Christian position give an account for logic? And here it is. Here's the creme de la creme now. The accounting of logic for logic again by PhD in logic atheist there's the article go and read it use of reason go and read matt slick on the topic go and read greg banson go and read gordon clark go and read van till on this topic uh, presuppositionalists like john flame people like that but here here's an atheist with a phd in logic and he He's now going to give us the creme de la creme. He's getting to the meat of it. So, let's go through it. What is logic? The, uh, the Shawnessy's view of logic seems to be entirely gained from the study of Clark, who you didn't, you've not really studied properly. God on Bible for people in the show. And it's also quite clear in reading your articles that you've not really fully engaged with God and Clark read or knows a teeny bit i only know a little bit about god and clark and you're definitely not representing him in, in, in the right way shawnee's view of logic seems to be entirely gained from the study of clark and that he is the only author cited rather than say aristotle or ferg on the topic of what logic is it seems that sean nessie is unaware of the controversy surrounding the topic so we see him that logic is the correct process of reasoning which is based on universally fixed rules of thought this idea that logic is about laws of thought significant idea coming to prominence in the 18th 19th centuries but there's never been a universal consensus among logicians now here's the point anybody who's who, who has any ability of scholarship what you just said I know that I've read the history of logic I know what Aristotle said I know what Hegel said and I'm not a professional in this area I'm, I'm just a very very basic layman so I know the basic standard history of logic and I know the current um, that, 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 that there are a varieties of different logic. I know that. Come someone who's not aware of that or doesn't seem to be aware of that, as you say. 
why not pick on someone who actually knows? Again, you're misrepresenting the presupposition of position because you're not actually engaging in the best of presuppositional scholarship, which again is reprehensible for an academic with a PhD. These days it's not widely represented among practicing logicians and philosophers at all. A quick overview. The reason for this is that the contemporary setting logic has a much broader extension. We know that. Anybody who even just reads a little bit about logic will know that. You're attacking the wrong people. Logic thought are broadly is concerning valid inference of various types of argument forms. It's not considered to be tied in any special manner to how we think logic to how we think but logic is not just how we think never the less shown in this miss no mention of simply simply says that logic has this 18th century relation to cognition again picking on the wrong man you should pick on someone who actually knows these things his out-of-date description of logic becomes confounded with outright misunderstandings when he spells out what he considers to be the three laws of thought now here i just thought this was nitpicking and goes on about the law of identity, the law of non contradiction and he's giving this, he gives a more precise definition. I think that you're just trying to assure that you're a professional in logic. But at the end of the day, it's just quibbling, it's just tinkering at the edges. It's not actually dealing with the question at hand. Just give me one minute. Uh, So, <clears throat> so let us continue. The Dr. Alex Malpass fallacy. So now he goes on to the logic in the Bible and he picks up on uh, Shawnee. Sean Essie's um, comments on logic in the Bible. Supposedly this guy that says the law of non-contradiction, A is not A, is an expression of the eternal character and nature of God. To Timothy 2.13, law of identity, A is A, it's expressed in God's name, who am I, Exodus 3.14, etc. So, basically what he does there is reduce it to saying, look, all right, these, you say that these laws uh, are in the Bible here, well, I could just as easily pick a character from a, a TV program, which he does, and say these laws apply to him, but it doesn't explain anything. That's basically Dr. Alex Malpass's argument. Um, he uses Alan Partridge to make that point. He gets on to the main thing here, and he says, if we are thinking of the examples of someone not contradicting themselves or of everyone being split into the with or against Casper, then we have a best particular instantations of these rules. But now the examples of rules consider the difference between a sign which said do not step on the grass, someone walking a path, a, um, along the path next to the grass. With regards to A, we would say that it had the rule do not step on the grass written on it. On the other B would just be an instance of something following the rule. Finding Jesus saying, saying, you are with me or aren't, would be like finding someone walking next to the grass. 
I, to me, I'm just tired of all that. I'm just tired of it because it. Anybody with half a brain who, who's got half half a brain would know that these arguments that this guy, that Dr. Alex Malpass is critiquing, are not strong arguments. Anybody with half a brain would know that. So again, why pick on someone? Why, why pick on someone like that? I, d I don't understand it. Continually to beat up on someone who are not using very strong arguments doesn't make sense to me. There is nothing special about the Bible such that you can find the three rules of thought in it. If you want to see what a book looks like which explicitly has the rule of non-contradiction in it, read Metaphysics. The most certain principle of all is that regard. Well, I've read that. I've read that a long time ago. Again, it's not getting to the issue, and it, you're setting up a straw man argument. Who's not the best in presuppositionalism? You're using their weak arguments to prop up and make it look as if you're knocking down presuppositionalism, but you're not actually dealing with the topic. Accounting for the laws of logic is not, in presuppositionalism, is not this way that you're knocking. Nature of logic. It's about the very nature of logic. And it's your definition of logic in that debate. That is the key. He goes on, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. An epistemological foundation for, log for logic. Sean Innes then presents the standard presuppositional line, the one we were, all knew was coming, where they brag about how great their account of logic is and how rubbish the other account is. The unbeliever, he quotes this guy, the unbeliever cannot account for logic in his own worldview and therefore cannot account for his ability to think rationally. The challenge has been made many times to unbelievers to account for logic in their own worldview. It's always fallen short or gone unanswered. Never has an adequate response been given. In formal debates, the challenge is often ignored by the unbeliever, yet the challenge demands an answer because debates presuppose logic. The unbeliever is required to use logic in order to make his arguments again. So he goes, so uh, Dr. Malpass says okay well we've seen this over and over again so i'm going to meet the challenge head on and provide a few different accounts of logic which could be epistemologically foundation for it now this guy who he quotes is absolutely bang on i've listened to lots and lots of debates on this topic with christians and it is true to say what this guy says he this guy knows what he's talking about and Alex Malplas is misrepresenting him here because it's true the atheist community internationally avoids this issue and cannot deal with this issue so let's see what he goes first of all what do we mean by the epistemological foundation for something well something in virtue of which we can come to know something so an epistemological foundation for X could be thought of an answer to the question, how is it that we are able to know about X? See, he likes to be abstract. Given that our question is, how is that it that we are able to know about logic and in particular those law, logical laws? Not to play the game right, I shall not appeal to God in any way. I will just go on along with the idea that logical laws are things that have some kind of ontology capable of allowing reference to them. And I would just pretend that these three principles cited by Sean Ithness, identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle, really are logical laws, even though it is clumsy and outdated way to talk about logic. I would play the game anyway, just to be a good sport. To Alex Malpass, you were very gracious. So let's see what the gracious Matt, Dr. Malpass says. 
It was the first way of answering the question. We are able to know about logical laws because they are, here it is. Now this is what I find refreshing. I find this refreshing. Because we're away from the PQs and all this stuff where he, 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 he hides from the issue. He's now going to have to nail his colors to his mask. So this is where his weak point is, and that is epistemology. Here is the first way of answering that question. We are able to know about logical laws because they are self-evident truths. This just means that to think about them is to know that they are true. They don't need anything else to support my knowledge of them because they are self-evident. This is really a simple answer and there isn't much more to be said about it. I'm sorry. My answer to that is, let's do an internal critique of your statement. Because they are self-evident truths. Okay, these self-evident truths are in, presumably, in your worldview, in reality. If these self-evident truths are in reality, then these self-evident truths will be consistent with your understanding of reality. Is your understanding of reality all that we know physical? We're doing an internal critique of what you're saying. So you need to answer that question. And don't dance around, Dr. Alex Malplast. Don't dance around. Don't dance around semantics. I know what you're going to do. You're going to play a semantic game. Or your, your question is not. Uh, given correctly because you didn't use the right word or you misrepresent in the field and if you looked at it this way and uh, give a, 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 a different statement or a different word here then actually it clarifies the situation no here's the question answer the question dr alex malpass answer this question is all that we know physical I'm doing an internal critique of your position. So it's not, it doesn't solve the issue when you say about logical laws because they are self evident truths. You've got to answer that question. Once you answer that question, then we're in a, another different kind of debate and it is not self evident truth. Either way you go, it's not going to be self evident. <laughs> The next thing he says, they are synthetic a priori knowledge. Now here, he uses a, a Kantian perspective. If we remove our own subject or even only the subjective in con constitution of the sense in general, then all constitution, all relations of objects in space and time, in these space and times themselves will disappear, just in themselves, but only in us. This is the key only in us is using Kant what may be the case with objects in themselves abstracted from all this receptivity of our sensibility sensibility remains entirely unknown to us we are acquainted with nothing except our way of perceiving them with a particular with which is peculiar to us and which therefore does not necessarily pertain to every being which is peculiar to us which therefore does not necessarily pertain to every being though to be sure it pertains to every human being. Then uh, Dr. Malpass, Alex Malpass says, and this, the question that I'm going to pose to you, Dr. Alex Malpass, I also pose to Ozzy as well when I give you the question. Synthetic, this is Dr. Alex Malpass's statement. Synthetic a priori knowledge as the property that it is integral to how we see the world is subjective in the sense that Kant explains above, that is, if we were to remove the subject, then it would also disappear. But it is also universal in the sense that it applies to every human being. So space-time may be known a priori, yet the knowledge is not simply analytic, i.e. true in virtue of the meaning of the words used, but synthetic, true because of more than just the meaning of the words used. What we know is the form of our... In this is the key. This is the key. What we know is, and I asked J.D. Kane, Ozzy, and Dr. Alex Malpass to answer this question when I give it in a minute. 
And this is the key here, the key of uh, of this bit, this part of his article, the synthetic priori knowledge, or priori not priori knowledge. What we know is the form of our intuition, which is non-trivial fact about the way things are, but is also directly available to us as subjects a priori we are programmed to see the world in the spatial temporal way okay again this breaks down we take your position and one of the things that presuppositionists presuppositionists do is an internal critique so we take your position and we do an internal critique of what you said you make the statement in this article that this intuition is universal within human beings. But you've negated yourself. You have undermined your position by rooting your defense of your understanding of the basic laws of logic. Sorry for the 18th and 19th century definitions of that. But you've undermined yourself. You've undermined your position. Correct me if I'm wrong, but do you not see yourself as accepting evolution? Now, correct me if I'm wrong, is not evolution a movement in history, a change in history? And so the default position where you say that there is this a universality of an intuition breaks down because what would be a universal intuition today may not be in a thousand years time so therefore you've collapsed yourself into subjectivism to the point where why would you even make an argument? Why would you ever say something is correct as opposed to something is wrong if those basic rules of engagement are based on purely a universal intuition that could and will change according to your internal system of thinking? So again, the two positions that you take up and, and they, they are indispensable is really doesn't is, is really the other two tied up really so conclusion so above so I'd like uh, if you get a chance dr. Alex Malpass could you deal with your fallacy that just because you use semantic words and just because you can use a bit of logic doesn't necessarily make it true Could you answer this video? Could you answer these questions? Could you deal with some of the points that I'm making? And I'm not a professional logician, so don't use that as a way of getting out of these questions. So oh, he doesn't understand the semantics of this or whatever. That that that's that's just intellectual dishonesty. Just deal with the basic arguments, basic questions that have been put to you. And Ozzy, deal with them yourself. Give us your reply. And JDK, give us your reply. So let's give the conclusion. So above are three distinct views about the epistemological foundation of logic. None of them require God or Jesus or Reformed theology at all. Mm, let me ask you another question. Have you ever read Herman Bavinck's Reformed Dogmatics? Yes or no? Have you ever read Herman Bavinck's Reform Dogmatics? Yes or no? No doubt they will continue over the Bible thumping window to claim that the challenge has been made many times to unbelievers to account for logic in their own worldview and it has always fallen short or gone unanswered. Never has an adequate response been given. True. Reality though, for those of us who have 
spent a long time doing philosophy seriously, these claims are easily countered. You've not demonstrated that, Dr. Alex Malpass. All you've demonstrated is you have a facility or quite a, a, a good ability at semantical games. You have a good ability in logical notation, but you have absolutely very little ability when it comes to epistemology. You have very little ability in understanding your opponents. And you have very little ability in doing internal critique on your own methodology. In order to be a good thinker, you've got to at least listen to your opponent's criticisms and represent them fairly, and that's what you've not done. I don't know what the right answer is about the nature of logic or how epistemology and logic fit together. Hmm. It's an incredibly complicated area. As with philosophy, it may be something we will ultimately never answer. How convenient for you, sir. Maybe that for some reason the question itself doesn't make sense. How convenient for you, sir, that this realization doesn't come from many generations yet. Maybe the answer is given in some obscure scroll now long forgotten by history. All these possibilities remain. But to claim that there is only one answer to this sort of question is silly. I have sought up three examples here by referencing well-known ideas in philosophy, and I could have easily plundered the great works of philosophy to find dozens of more. Well, I think really what you are showing there is that you, what, what you show to me, uh, Dr. Alex Malpalas, is you're highly intelligent. You're brilliant at arguing in the area of semantics. There's no doubt about it. You're very good at semantical arguments. Second, thirdly, you're very good in understanding your own field, which is logical notation. But what is apparent to me in reading your articles is you're very wet behind the ears. You've, you, you, there's one thing in being smart and knowing a lot about philosophy. But there's a difference between being smart and knowing a lot about philosophy and being wise and knowing about a lot about philosophy. And you're smart and you know a lot about philosophy, but you're not wise. When you've been in academic circles for 10 years or more than 10 years now, it must be going on for 14, 15 years, and you read articles, you 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 read books, you 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 listen to lectures in philosophy, you listen to like you 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 gain experience in engaging with a wide field of scholarship. You you gain experience in in mature thinking, and that's different from being very very smart and knowing your stuff to being very wise and knowing your stuff. And because you're not wise in your understanding of philosophy or experienced in your understanding of philosophy, you've left yourself exposed on so many fronts. And that is because of your immaturity, because you're a young man who thinks he knows it all. But in reality, you're very smart. You're very clever, you know some things, but you're not very wise because wisdom would teach you if you learn about philosophy, there are certain things in philosophy when you learn from a, a, that there are a variety of debates that have gone on that if you understood them, if you had the, the experience in academic circles for a long period of time that you wouldn't fall into the traps that you fall into in this, art, this article on logic. Those are my thoughts. That's my honest opinion. I'm not saying I'm greatly wise or anything. I'm not saying I'm as clever as you. You're much more clever than me, Dr. Alex Malpass. I'm not saying I know more about logic than you. No, you know, you're a professional in logic. I'm not. But I do have the advantage of having the wisdom of being in academic circles and listening to theologians and theologians who talk about philosophy over many, many years 
the advantage of reading about philosophy and theology over many, many years. And because I have that experience, I can see that you're leaving yourself exposed on many fronts. Or I can't take away from the fact that you're very, very smart and that your own particular topic you know very, very well. But that doesn't give you the right to use the knowledge that you have in logic. It doesn't give you a pass to get away in moving into epistemology or moving into critiquing a particular point of view like presuppositionalism when it's obvious that you're not well equipped to do that. This is my opinion anyway. I call it the Alex Malpass uh, fallacy just because you can do, uh, you're very good at semantical analysis and very good at uh, logic does not give you, it doesn't make, it doesn't mean that what you're saying is correct when it comes to these arguments against presuppositionalism on, on the issue of logic. All right, thank you for listening and take care. God bless you. Um, be interesting to hear what Dr. Alex Malpass says. If you come uh, come back at me and make a video response, or you go on a Google Hangout, if you want me to come on a Google Hangout and talk to you about these issues, you, Ozzy, and JD Kane, let me know. Give me a couple of weeks' notice because I I go I'd have to go and uh, prepare myself. If you want to debate on the topic of, of logic and presuppositionism. Um, I'm happy to debate you and uh, Ozzy and uh, JD Kane uh, on the topic, um, but you'd have to give me a couple of weeks' notice. All right, thank you for listening. Take care. God bless you. And um, be interested to hear what you have to say. So, God bless you. And have a good day, folks. Don't forget my website, jasonburnspreacher.com. 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 God bless you and take care. God bless. Thank <laughs> you.